participants will introduce themselves. So Zen, introduce yourself. Hi, I'm Zendor, and yes, you have been expecting me. I'll be your guide as we peer into the depths of what keeps us afraid, angry, ignorant, and immobile. How was that? <laughs> My friends call me Zen. I have been graced by um, Debbie's choice to be allowed to speak with you during this time, and I really am thankful. I'm humbled by it. And I would like to ask your permission to be able to speak about some things that may take what already expanded consciousness you have to yet a new level. Part of what I'm going to be sharing, as you can see by the slide, is uh, about the messy antic complex. Kind of a play on words there. Many of us feel like we have missions and that we are here to do something of utmost import for not only ourselves, but for the world. And I think NDEers, cancel that, I know NDEers are much more open to this kind of knowing than most others because of their direct experience of knowing that there is more than just this world. Now, as you can see by the initials up there, a little bit more about me. I've got a Master of Arts in Organizational Management, an MBA in Project Management, Certified Hypnotherapist, Transformational Life Coach, and an Honorary, honorary Doctorate in Divinity. And there's probably a few more in there. I've been in the aerospace industry. I was a production control coordinator for $7 million a month in shipments back when I was in my 20s. I uh, actually have four children and eight grandchildren, so I have the experience of both a father and a grandparent, and that I've advanced through all of those from the aerospace industry to uh, some very interesting experiences in the television industry, music, uh, theater, and arts and crafts. Um, I've been blessed with a plethora of, it, of opportunities for experience. So moving right along, when I was younger, I kind of got set up. And how that happened was through an adoption. I knew very young, I think it was five when my parents told me. Shortly thereafter, though, I heard a voice. I was standing in the, at the top of the staircase. We had a, a dual staircase so the landing was looking out over the front porch of the house and I was looking out in the evening waiting for dad to come home and I hear a voice say hey you I wasn't quite sure what to do except spin around and say mom mom do you hear that voice of course she didn't and she was within 15 feet I knew that she had to have heard that voice well no such luck and she actually blew it off and said, no, I didn't hear anything. Must have been a peeping Tom. Well, our town did have a peeping Tom. So, however, I knew instinctively at that time that the voice came from inside. Now, why? Wasn't quite sure. But we did develop a relationship over the years, and I eventually found out who it was. We moved into a new house about a year after that, and I started having out-of-body experiences. Now, as you all know, especially the experiencers, there's that segue in between being in your body and being outside your body that you have to basically confront yourself and allow yourself to move from one place to another. Can I see some shaking heads? Okay. Mine's bobbing up and down anyway. It's good for everybody. So what happens is that in that interim, there's a question of, am I dying? And then there's an acknowledgement of, no, but boy, this really feels cool. So as a child, you can imagine that understanding or having the opportunity to do that and get up and fly around the house and then the neighborhood and then the town gave one, this one, the opportunity to really get comfortable with yet another 
capacity or sensory apparatus that we actually all have and we are capable of doing. Now, and I think this was also prep work for the, the next experience, which was a series of, uh, they weren't really dreams, because I'd wake up in bed in the, actually not in bed, I'd be up in the corner of my bedroom watching my physical body get out of bed, climb out through my bedroom window. Now this is rural Indiana. Climb out my bedroom window, walk across the neighbor's yard, climb a fence and walk out into a 10 acre pasture basically. And as I would walk out to the center of the pasture, I'd start rising up into the air. Well, I looked up initially and I see this huge orange cigar shaped cloud that spans the field and probably twice the length on either side of it. Now the observer would become one with the participant as I would enter the cloud. I'd wake up in bed the next morning and go, wow, can't wait to go back. Never really remembered what was going on inside of that cloud, nor did I equate it with anything at that time. Nevertheless, it lasted for about two years and at least twice a month it would happen. So it was a very uh, thrilling experience and, and yet there was still this, uh, for lack of a better, non-local consciousness that was happening in the process. Now during this time also, as a kid, I think we all ha actually have insatiable curiosities, especially when we have experiences that are beyond the norm or that really intrigue us to learn and grow and experience and explore and really, in some cases, exponentiate our understanding of what we're capable of doing, even though, and I'll use the Star Trek term, the grups don't have a way, remember the grown-ups, Star Trek episode, anybody? Okay. So we have the ability to move beyond that. Now, of course in the BS, that stands for belief system, Okay, we have a challenge to change. Now, when I went into college, um, I actually was a brainiac as a kid. I may have a few cells left. However, I tested out of five quarters going into uh, Ball State University. So I was also living in the honors dorm. And I went through a period where I was really sincerely questioning uh, you know, the whole thing about the adoption and why, and why am I here, where am I going, what am I doing, what's up? So I hit my knees one day and I prayed and I said, Father, I want to know what truth is and I'm willing to die for it if necessary. Now, that was probably one of the most, I've had a few prayers that were that deep and that centered from the depths of my being. Little did I know that I was kind of uh, playing prayer poker. You know, instead of Russian roulette, I, it was a little different form. So the following week, I came back from class and I put on an album. We had albums at that time. And it was by a band called Journey. I don't know if any of you are familiar with them, but their very first album was very much an exploration of soul and connecting to it. So a song called In the Morning Day, lyrics, right before the, there's a guitar riff that sounds like a rocket ship taking off, well right in between those two, this voice that I'd been familiar with since a child says, this is my given name, Bruce, are you willing to die for what you believe in? Oh shit. Uh, Christ consciousness, cosmic consciousness, absolutely. Okay, guitar riff comes up, I feel myself leave my body. I turn to look at my body laying across my dorm room bed, and then turn back to look where I'm going and immediately engulfed by white light. Now as an impetuous teenager, I was there for maybe 15, 20 seconds, just long enough to orient, recognize that, okay, I can still see even though it's white, I'm not dead, I can think. Uh, I have no tactile sensation with my body. Wow, is there more? I felt a movement. I found myself then in a sphere of pinpoints of light with an indigo background. I instinctively knew that these pinpoints of light 
were points of consciousness. Whether in body or not, wasn't sure, because I knew I wasn't. At that point in time, as though this other voice was listening to my thoughts, it spoke and it said, these are those that you are to work with in order to facilitate a new world order. It will happen in your lifetime. Know this to be true. Your path will be full of trials and tribulations. Have faith and trust that everything you need will be there at its appointed time. Trust and allow. And with that, I felt another rush of energy and I <gasps> back in my body. Kept my eyes closed. The feeling of that reintegration was exquisite, <laughs> to say the least. But then, 18 years old, what the hell do you do with that? Okay, am I the one? No, I don't think so, because it talked about all of these others. So there's this differentiation, and there's this capacity to move beyond self and realize you're part of a whole. Well, during that process too, after I came back, I opened up to the clairols. Clairaudience, clairsentience, clairvoyance, okay. I used to get joked about, you know, Bruce and his font, right? so I figured I'd bring in the clairols. So, in that process then, I also had an experience of hearing many others speaking. Now, these were other voices. They were very, and of course this was at college, under pressure, going back and forth between the dorm room and the cafeteria, so I was hearing all of these negative, self-degrading, self-deprecating thoughts that all started with you. Well, I was already answering to hey you. So I thought it was all about me. Well, contrary to popular opinion, it's not all about me. However, what I was doing was freaky. I, I just didn't understand it. So I locked myself up in the dorm room. Fortunately, I had a friend that came over and, and said, the hell are you doing? And I said, well, this is, here's what's happening. And he said, are those voices yours? And I said, no. And he said, and? So at that point, I realized, oh, those aren't me. It's not about me. They were others speaking their self-deprecating thoughts, which we all do during that period of life, I think. We're always beating up on ourselves, and maybe to this day. I hope not. However, it gave me the insight of being able to begin to discern what to pay attention to and what not to pay attention to. Now, also during that time, uh, I was reading many books from um, Siddhartha to a whole slew of things from Carlos Castaneda. And I had the question of, okay, do it, if I have a guide, who is he? What, what's his name? How can I communicate? A couple of days later, in meditation again, center my vision, the name or the picture of an ancient looking Indian and the name Zephyr came into my mind, same instant. So from that point in time, there was this knowing that I was able to, to move forward with and through another friend of mine who began to actually had a, a great metaphysical upbringing, he could do automatic writing. So I contacted him to find out about Zephyr. Found out Zephyr is now, or was in what is now the southwestern United States over 20,000 years ago. I'm thinking to myself, I want to go there. Now I'm at Ball State University in Muncie, Indiana. So a little distance there. So what happened was a few years later, uh, married, working as a machinist, meat cutter, and playing in a band, all three jobs fell through. I walked out on the front porch the following morning, said, looked up at the sun, okay, I'm listening, where do you want me to go? I hear Phoenix. So guess what happened? We picked up and moved. Now the fall after we got there, I'm standing in front of my grinder I was an ID or a grinder production specialist initially in the aerospace industry. And I felt a presence step onto my last board platform, which is in front of the machine. Some of you machinists probably know what I'm talking about. The rest of you, it really doesn't matter. At any rate, I felt him step onto it. 
or felt someone step onto it. Look, there was nobody there, knew who it was. I heard, grab a pen and paper and draw. The symbol that you see up here now is what I drew. Of course, it was a little rougher at that time. However, it contains quite a bit. Just in looking at the very tip of it, there was an answer that bridged science and spirituality for me, and that was a number of knowledge and wisdom to be understood or to be interpreted with he who hath understanding, which let's say science maybe? Okay, where's the simplest place that that shows up? Carbon atom. Six protons, six electrons, six neutrons. And guess what that does? Connects us all and much more. It's amazing what sentience can do. So several years later after my divorce, I went through a period of really reconnecting one of the greatest summers of my life is 1989. My divorce was fi final on 11 88 Power numbers? <laughs> Pretty powerful. So I'm getting ready to go through an experience called multi-level awareness. So it was developed by a guy named William Swigard back in the 50s. Many of you probably are familiar with him. As I was beginning, beginning to go through it, Zephyr shows up, says, come, I leave. We're heading across the universe. Took us eight minutes to arrive at this three sun solar system with about a dozen lush green planets around it and we're at the perimeter. The suns take one voice and say, we are not only your forefathers, we are also the forefathers of your solar system. I start to ask questions. Zephyr says, nope, that's it. You got all you need, you'll figure it out. I'm like, oh, thanks. <clears throat> so eight minutes traveling back. Now the only place I've ever heard a reference of the speed of thought is in the Urantia book, which it sa states it at 241 trillion miles per second. So shortly after that then, I had the opportunity to produce a television show called it One World. What was it about? Creating a common understanding of how we move through fear and how we can help each other to do the same. I interviewed Probably over 200 people, had 120 shows in all from 1990 to 92. So I kind of pioneered that really in-depth, let's, you know, crack open the egg, peer inside and see what we can find in common. During that same period of time, I had many visitations. Now, these visitations were not just spirits, which I have had. Uh, what they were, were what we might call extraterrestrials. Now, what were they doing in my sphere? Well, before I moved out to Phoenix, the last thing that happened at a bookstore in Muncie was I was walking through the, the store, it's a metaphysical bookstore, book falls off the shelf, I open it up, flip it over, first paragraph that I read, most common UFO contactee experiences in the late 50s, early 60s in the Midwest were orange cigar shaped clouds. What do you do with that? Well, yeah. You deal with the experience, okay? So from that then, there was this question of, okay, what's going on here? What am I doing? And the thing that kept coming up was it had to do something with the Galactic Federation and specifically the Ashtar Command. Well, those are, if any of you have heard of those, I'm not gonna have a whole lot of time to, to go into that right now, but I would encourage you to Google them and you'll find out things and, and allow yourself to be moved into another um, place. So one of the most important crop circles that I have seen to date when the binary code was deciphered, the message was beware of the bearers of gifts and the broken promises. Much pain but still time. Believe there is good out there. We oppose the deceivers. The conduit is closing. Now that conduit is the deception is the inability to understand that we are all one. Consciousness is moving up. It's opening. We're all a part of that. Each one of us and our experiences plug into the critical mass and allow it to expand as well. And because I am running short on time here, what I'd like for you to do now, in some cases, when, and maybe even when I just spoke about the Galactic Federation and the Ashtar Command and things like that, you might have gone, oh, wait a minute, and your energy just kind of compressed for a moment. 
Well, that's essentially what I term an emotional blockage. And that is to openness and just exploring. So what I'd like you to do for just a moment is close your eyes, put your fingertips together, take a deep breath, feel your heartbeat in your fingertips. one of the oldest forms of connecting with your heart that there is. The moment you feel your heartbeat in your fingertips, you are out of your head. You are in your feeling. Your mind is silent and you can hear from that place of silence. Whenever you have constriction, when you're presented with new information that's outside of your direct experience, for instance, and you wonder, rather than judge or condemn or be critical, take a moment, pause, take a deep breath, and ask from that place of silence, what is? That alone will lead you to transformation unimaginable on a regular basis, if you so desire. If you'd like to know more, I have a book for sale in the bookstore. It's called Transformation, A Guide for Change. And it encompasses many of the tasty tidbits that I've been able to garner over the years of how to keep myself sane while dealing with experience beyond this world and those of uh, many persuasions that tend to want to challenge my reality. It's my story, I'm sticking to it. Thank you very much, namaste. And Ted, thank you so much for bringing through you know, the, the veins that you have access to and, and when I connected with Yeshua because a lot of people connect with his archetype, even though they may not even have a relationship with the being that we call Yeshua Ben Joseph, and the Native Americans call him Yellow Hand. And so when we talked in my journey, when he went through that rite of passage and opened up to that cosmic Christ frequency, the main symbol that he used was share with people about the better form of You know, that I went from being Yeshua to Christ and then being synonymous. Gee, that's amazing that that would show up on the cover of the book. Actually, butterfly is a, the symbol for transformation. Yeah. Um, I particularly, for most of the, I would say for almost 40, uh, 33 years, any 34 years, oops, don't want to use that number. Um, I actually wore a Christ head pendant that was part of, of my daily centering. I would always question, okay, you know, the, the little, you know, what would Jesus do? Kind of thing. But take it to the next level of, okay, what kind of, like the, the picture I had up of him laughing, okay, what kind of audacious level could I take this to that would allow that freedom of spirit that comes from within all of us to be shared? And I found that even with working with some of the, the folks that I've had to had the opportunity to help transition from this world to the next, uh, showing up and actually complete physical form at the end of the bed, moving the bed just to make sure that I got that they were there, and then continuing a conversation of what it was like on the other side and, and the questions that they had of how to integrate with it. So that also is something that's available that, you know, if we are able to picture a person's face and look into their eyes, what do we know the eyes to be? Gateway to the soul. So that connection is there. Thanks, Dietrich. <laughs>